So welcome to SISAS module number three, lesson number two. Uh, in this particular module, we're going to be talking, or this lesson within module number three, we're going to be talking about authorization. We've already done the box where we talked about authentication in a previous lesson and all the different components that are involved in authentication. Now it's all about what we've already authenticated the endpoint. Now what is it that they're allowed to do on the system? You know, what can they access? What resources do they have access to and so on? So we're going to talk about authorization as a general concept in ICE, uh, an over, overview of different authorization policies. But we'll talk about what are downloadable ACLs, authorization profiles, authorization policies, how we build compound conditions to provide for authorization. We'll describe authorization configuration procedures, what the rule matching logic is within ICE to be able to identify what authorization uh, pieces are applied to the users, how to configure an authorization profile, how to configure an authorization policy rule, how can we tune the default authorization policy rule, which is uh, always at the end of our, our list of policies, and then how do we verify uh, using the GUI, uh, both machine authorization and user authorization. Uh, and then verifying the authorization of ICE itself, right? How do we verify that downloadable ACLs are assigned uh, to the authenticator as well? All right, so lots of interesting things that we'll be talking about in this particular um, chapter, okay? Authorization policies, uh, the second major component of ICE, basically, uh, which provides network authorization services that allows you as an administrator to define different authorization policies, configured different authorization uh, profiles, for example, for specific users or groups of users that want to access specific network resources in your topology. All right. Network authorization policies take rules uh, with specific user and group identities uh, to create something called an authorization profile, all right? When we have rules that match config, you know, specific attributes that we're matching, the authorization profile grants permission based on that policy and then applies network access authorization based, uh, you know, whatever the policy is based on that policy and according to that particular policy, all right? Authorization policies, and we'll see this as we kind of go through this lesson here, some of the details, but authorization policies uh, have conditional requirements. And when we combine several of those identity groups using compound conditions, uh, which means we're checking basically, making various authorization checks, we can return a specific profile. All right. Uh, and that's what they're referencing here on the diagram. We've already authenticated the users, so we've gone through and passed the users through the authorization process. Now we're going and checking all of our authorization conditions, which then based on those conditions, we're going to go ahead and apply an authorization profile. Uh, and that could be an access accept, an access reject, reject a change of authorization. Uh, but you'll notice here from authorization, we can then direct the component or the device through one of these other engines, right? Uh, profiling engine, the guest services engine, or the posture engine if we're trying to do some sort of posture assessment on the device. Uh, that could then force the uh, device to go back through the authentication process so that we could do a change of authorization once we've done, you know, remediation or whatever it is that we're trying to accomplish based on the authorization, okay? So these authorization policies uh, contain all of these conditional requirements uh, that get combined together to create this authorization check and then obviously provide us uh, or return us to an authorization profile. There are conditional requirements that exist apart from the use of specific identity groups, uh, which is like the default. We'll, we'll see more about the default authorization, which is the default any in the in the list, but we can have policies based on several different attributes, right? It, I mean, ICE by, by definition is an attribute-based policy system. It looks at attributes of devices and it looks at attributes of components and it makes decisions based on those attributes. Uh, 
Uh, and an identity group is one of those many attributes that are available. All right. Now, authorization profiles can include lots of different permissions that can be applied to the entity that's being authorized, right? We have standard profiles, we have something called exception profiles, and then we have something called device-based profiles. Uh, and we'll take a look at the difference between the, the standard, the exception, and the device-based profiles as part of our discussion in this particular chapter, all right? A profile consists of attributes that are chosen from a specific set of resources. Where are those resources stored? Do you guys remember? Andy? Do you know? Okay. The, the library? The dictionary, right? Right. Library, dictionary, yep. So we have a bunch of these set resources. They're stored in the dictionary, and then these get returned when a specific compound condition or a specific authorization policy matches, all right? Because the authorization policies can include compound conditions, which map to a single network service rule, they can also include a bunch of, or at least a list of different authorization checks, all right? Now, if you have a simple scenario, the authorization checks are made using a basic AND Boolean operator within a particular rule, right? We have an option of choosing AND or OR. Uh, but if you have an advanced scenario, uh, authorization verification expressions can be used, but uh, these authorization verifications have to comply with the different authorization profiles that are being returned. Uh, that probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense right now, but as we go through some of the examples and look at some of the configurations in this lesson, that might make a little bit more sense uh, later on. All right, we're going to talk about the, the concept of simple scenarios versus advanced scenarios. All right. Authorization verification uh, is always probably going to include at least more than one condition. Uh, maybe a user-defined name that gets added to the library, uh, and then that can be re reused by other authorization policies as well because it's a member of the dictionary. All right. Now, becoming familiar with what exists in that dictionary is part of the process of understanding ICE. We're not going to get into the details of that. We don't actually dive into the, the, the de definitions that are in the dictionary. It's just too much information to cover. But... Uh, that's that's a difficult part of understanding ICE is understanding those those uh, conditions that we can match against. All right. So there are uh, a couple of things that I want to define uh, before we move on through the rest of the chapter here because I think it's really important to understand. Uh, we have authorization profiles, of course. We see that box listed here. We have policy elements, we have network authorization, we have different authorization policies, and then we finally have access control lists, which apply a certain set of permissions. So let me start by, even though we don't necessarily see it on this slide, let me start by defining what network authorization is. All right? Obviously, our goal here is to ensure that the client or the device meets specific sets of requirements which allows them to access the ICE network and whatever resources ICE is protecting. Network authorization controls users' access to the network, right? What can the user access on the network, what systems and what resources are available on the network, and so on. The Cisco ICE network uh, really is the set of permissions that you're going to apply to the users, right? Do I have the ability to read, read uh, information? Do I have the ability to write information? Do I have the ability to execute information? So we can create a whole bunch of different authorization policies that, that meet whatever needs that we need uh, for our particular network, all right? There are some policy elements as well 
Uh, policy elements would include things like the rule name, uh, identity groups, conditions, permissions, and so on. Uh, all these different policy elements are going to be referenced when we're actually creating policy rules. And when we go in and choose uh, conditions and attributes that we create that we that we want to reference to create specific types of authorization policies, uh, actually authorization profiles, really at this point because that's what we're referencing. Okay, so what is an authorization profile? We see the box listed here on the slide, right? This is our authorization profile right here, but what does that include? All right? Of course, it's going to have a name. We name all of our profiles. It's going to have some sort of description. And then we can associate really three of the different authorization restrictions that we can apply, right? A downloadable ACL could be associated to a profile. A VLAN can be associated to a profile. And a security group ACL can be associated to a profile. Uh, and then we can also associate a bunch of different attributes from the dictionary. So that's what a profile entails. And we'll see how we configure the profiles a little bit later on in this lesson. All right. So what is an authorization policy then? Uh, because that's, you know, the main box that's highlighted here. This entire box references the authorization policy. But what does that actually include? I mean, I think you guys understand the general concept, right? Well, just like we had authentication policies, a set of rules, either simple or complex rules that we could apply uh, that would result in some sort of action taking place. Well, that's essentially what an authorization policy is. All right, could be a single rule, could be a set of rules that you define, right? There is a default rule, but typically we're defining our own set of rules. Uh, and the combination of those rules together creates the policy, all right? You might, for example, have a standard policy that includes the rule name uh, using that if-then construct that we talked about previously. And then we link a value entered for a particular identity group with a specific condition or set of conditions or even maybe some attributes of a device to produce a specific set of permissions that create this unique authorization profile, right? Uh, there are basically two different types of authorization policies that you can set up in ICE. There's what we call first match rules apply, and then there's what we call multiple matched rules apply. And we'll get into the details of that a little bit later on in this lesson. All right. Uh, I think the name kind of implies it's, it's the concept, right? First matched or multiple matched will identify, uh, based on the policy table, how we're going to match users' permissions based on uh, the rules, all right? There are also two types of authorization policies that we can configure in, in ICE as well, a standard authorization policy and what we call an exception authorization policy, all right? Uh, most of the time, you're going to be dealing with standard authorization policies, but sometimes you'll be dealing with exception policies. A standard policy is basically any policy that's created that stays in effect for, a, you know, kind of a long period of time. You know, most of the policies that we tend to work into our environment over a, a long period of time, right? It's going to apply to a large group of users or devices, uh, and it's going to allow access to specific elements in our network, different endpoints and so on. Uh, these are stable policies, uh, you know, common set of privileges, common set of groups of users, and so on. Uh, in fact, standard policies can even be used as templates. So you can modify some of the original values to meet your specific needs and create different types of standard policies. Exception policies are called exception policies because of the type of policy and, and it's acting essentially in exception to what one of the standard policies might be doing. Uh, for the most part, these exception policies are intended for authorizing limited access, um, could be short-term policies or specific types of network devices, specific network endpoints or groups, and so on. All right, they're typically short-term, authorizing maybe a limited number of users or devices, 
Uh, and it basically, uh, an exception policy allows you to create a specific set of values, uh, essentially user-defined, customized values uh, that we can apply to a specific identity group. All right. And then finally, uh, with regard to ICE, we have access control lists. All right. Now, ACLs on ICE are a little bit different than ACLs that you see in a standard system. Uh, there's a set of permissions that are attached to a specific object or a specific network resource. Uh, and this ACL allows us to specify what users or what groups um, get provided access, right? Get granted access to a specific object. Um, so, Typically, an ACL specifies like a subject, an operation. Uh, typically, ACLs are going to be uh, either permit or deny rules or a set of permit or deny rules that allow us to define what's allowed and what's not allowed. All right. All right. So we'll get into in this uh, in this the rest of this lesson, taking a look at what the configuration looks like uh, and so on. Um, now. One other thing I want to mention, because I think you mentioned this, Andy, as part of your questions about the study questions. Um, if we're doing condition-based policy scenarios, all right? Condition-based means like what it meant in authentication. I'm doing checks uh, using AND Boolean operations within a rule. Uh, and I can have these compound condition-based policies. The type of authorization verification can be used based on whether we're doing simple or complex condition-based matching. Uh, different verifications typically include more than one condition. Very rarely are we matching on just a single condition. Uh, and then we can actually reference different dictionaries or attributes within a dictionary uh, based on airspace, based on Cisco, Cisco BBSM, Microsoft, Radius, and so on. All right, we'll get into the airspace and Cisco and Cisco BBSM stuff a little bit later on when we talk about dictionaries and dictionary attributes and so on. All right, uh, just to mention real quick, uh, Andy, since you uh, since you had asked about it, um, uh, I was going to try and maybe describe the airspace dictionary and what's in it but uh, let me let me defer that until a later time because it's uh, we do have a, a section where we do talk about uh, the different dictionaries and what's included in those different dictionaries all right and dictionary attributes yeah that's fine I, it just came up on the uh, uh, in that study guide yeah and it's one it's one that I didn't I wasn't exposed to when I was deploying this and so I just figured it, it if it's sure. something we covered that I missed, I might as well ask about it. No, nope, we didn't cover it yet. So, not yet. We'll get there. All right. So, just like authentication, ICE uh, provides kind of a modular approach to setting up our network authorization policy. Uh, it's made of a set of rules. The rules have four central components. The rule name, which I mentioned before, the identity group, the conditions, and then finally the permissions. The rule name is just an alphanumeric name to identify the rule. Uh, typically, we're going to name the rule so based on its purpose or based on its function. And then we have identity groups. Okay, specification of users or endpoint groups from ICE. Okay, we can set up multiple groups. Uh, using a logical or binding. We'll talk a little bit more about how we create these identity groups and what the identity group is supposed to include. Uh, we can kind of see the identity groups listed. For example, we have 81 external groups equals secure-x.local slash users slash domain admins. So we've specified that as administrators and then local users is going to fall within the employee group and so on. So. Uh, and then we're applying permissions based on those those um, conditions, right? If if it's an employee or if it's an AD one, 
external groups equals secure dash x dot local slash user slash domain admins. Um, so uh, we could match groups that define things like uh, uh, you know different types of devices, Android, Apple iDevices, Cisco IP phones. We can identify print servers, badge readers if we're if we're focusing on devices, or we could simply identify individual users, right? Now the conditions specify uh, basically contextual requirements for a specific rule, right? Simple conditions basically specify an attribute that's selected from the dictionary along with the value of the attribute required for the condition to be matched. Compound conditions link multiple conditions together with a operator, either and or or, uh, and uh, in Boolean operations, and uh, we can have multiple conditions that are referenced, right? Uh, some of the attributes that we can match could be, is it an Ethernet device, is it wireless or 802.11, is it connecting to a specific wireless SSID, um, and so on. All right. Permissions, the specification of the authorization profile. In other words, what is this particular component or device or user allowed to do? Obviously, the whole point of an authorization profile is to specify permissions, right? So these profiles get defined separately from the authorization rules. The authorization profile defines an appropriate set of permissions based on context-sensitive matches within the identity group. And if those conditions specified are matched in the uh, author, um, you know, we've already gone through the authentication and we've matched conditions in the authentication, now we're simply going through and specifying the authorization. Common things that we can apply, you can see a downloadable ACL, a VLAN, voice permissions, posture discovery. If I want to go through and do a posture assessment, I want to apply MACSEC, smart port configurations, airspace ACLs, uh, and so on. So lots and lots of different options uh, for specifying the authorization profile. Okay. Uh, I mentioned this already, ICE is an attribute-based policy system. Uh, identity groups and conditions are used to define what attributes are important for making specific policy decisions. Authorization profiles, based on what we set in our rule permissions, specify the results of that policy decision. All right, And we saw that on, on the previous slide here, right? We're going through the process of identifying different authorization conditions, but then we're applying an authorization profile to that user. The output of that authorization profile could include any of these things, or it can include this, right? Access accept, access reject, or change of authorization. So this is these are really the pieces that are a result of that authorization profile. And that's what they're describing in this particular case. All right. All right, next thing we're talking about is a downloadable ACL. Um, as we can see from the bullet points here, a common method to control network access. Uh, source IP address is set to any, but then we're trying to identify what the client can access from a destination perspective. These are assigned per port and per host, depending on uh, the 802.1x host mode, if we're doing multi-authentication uh, host mode or single host mode or whatnot. Uh, they're downloaded to the network access device once, uh, and these downloadable ACLs can be used more than one time, right? They can be, be applied to a single port, or they can be applied to multiple ports in the network. Okay, I, ICE does provide ICE does provide a way to uh, create the syntax. You can see an example of the downloadable ACL content on this particular slide. In this case, deny ICMP from any two host 1010.2.20 and permit IP any any. All right. Uh, ICE has policies that are built from different policy elements. We have dictionaries, we have conditions, and we have results. These are the three components of the policy elements that are part of ICE. A downloadable ACL is an example of a result policy element, right? I've authenticated you, I've authorized you, now, based on that authorization, the result is applying this downloadable ACL to your interface or to the port that you're connected to. Uh, 
Uh, basically, it's just an example of an authorization policy result in particular. Some other options would be to apply a VLAN, to uh, apply another secondary process to the client, like profiling the client or, or providing some sort of posture assessment to the client. Downloadable ACLs are, are a pretty common element that are used to restrict client access to network resources. Obviously, you have to have a pretty good understanding of how to create these downloadable ACLs and how you apply, apply them, but, uh, uh, but it's, a, it's a very important component. All right. All right. The downloadable ACLs uh, get configured and maintained centrally on Cisco ICE. ICE then pushes those downloadable, downloadable ACLs down to the network access device when a client has been authenticated and is granted access to the network. Uh, the, the, NAT, the NAT itself is what applies the downloadable ACLs to the, to the client access port uh, in the inbound direction. So we're trying to, we're not filtering to the client, we're filtering from the client going into the network or the domain. All right. Uh, we'll apply that downloadable ACL, uh, ACL on a per port basis uh, or per host, depending on the configuration of the 802.1x host mode. Remember we talked about there were four, well, technically five different host modes that we could support in ICE. Um, and uh, whether it was multiple hosts on a single port or where they all need to be authenticated, whether it was a single host on a port where only one host could be authenticated, whether it was multiple hosts on a port where a single authentication will result in the authorization of everybody on that port and so on. All right. Uh, that's what they're referencing there when, we, when, when they mention the host mode in this particular case. The source IP address uh, is always configured in the downloadable ACL as any. Uh, the network access device will replace this particular statement with the actual IP address of the host. So the downloadable ACL only needs to be downloaded to the NAD one time uh, if that same DACL is supplied or, or um, changed or modified or supplied in subsequent authorizations. It won't be re-downloaded unless there's a specific change to the ACL because you may decide to change what that ACL looks like you know, in the future based on, you know, future requirements or different security requirements. Um, that copy actually stays resonant on the network access device uh, and then it will actually be duplicated or applied to other endpoints as well that use that same downloadable ACL. All right. The ICE will actually provide uh, a syntax checker uh, you can see that the link at the bottom of the, the page here it says uh, check the DACL syntax uh, and uh, just you know verifying uh, that the appropriate syntax is being configured or applied in the downloadable ACL uh, based on I mean it doesn't check you know based on you know what policy you're trying to implement it's just trying to make sure that the syntax is appropriate to apply the ACL through command line on the network access device. So it doesn't go through and say, okay, this uh, rule number one is more specific than rule number two. That's good. Uh, rule number three is, uh, is less, less specific than rule number one, but more specific than rule number two. So you know how on Cisco IOS, it might actually give you a warning or indicate that uh, a rule uh, a subsequent rule is being trumped by a previous rule that's listed in the, the ACL. This particular syntax checker doesn't check for that. It's just looking for the actual raw syntax to making sure that making sure that the syntax meets the right um, conditions. All right. The next step is to create an authorization profile. Uh, we do this by going to policy, policy elements and results, and we can see the authorization profile. In this case, it's called employee underscore corp. Uh, the access type is access accept. We're going to apply a downloadable ACL. In this case, the downloadable ACL is employee full access DACL. Uh, the VLAN is going to be VLAN 10. 
Uh, and then we can specify different voice domain permissions and web redirection and so on. Uh, these are some of the common tasks and they're a little bit truncated. There's a few other tasks that exist here as well. Uh, basically the profile is all the permissions that are chosen from based on the options that you see here on the screen plus a few other options that are kind of cut off. Uh, the authorization profiles get applied when an authorization rule that references the profile gets matched, right? Where we're applying this authorization profile based on a match condition. The authentication rules use identity group memberships and context specific conditions to define when an authentication rule is applicable. And if the requirements are met, the authorization profile referenced by the name from the authorization rule is then applied. In this case, like I said, employee underscore corp means that we're going to apply the downloadable ACL employee full access DACL and set the VLAN to 10. All right. This would have to be referenced from our authorization profiles that are configured, excuse me, our authorization policy that's configured under the authorization option here. So when we go into authorization, we can set up our policy. Okay. Uh, and that's what we're going to see on the next next slide here. All right. An authorization policy basically has one or more rules. The order is significant. It is processed from the top down. Uh, we're going to basically match on specific conditions. Is it a local user? Is it an endpoint or identity group? What are the conditions that we're going to try and match from the library? Are there different attributes or values that we're matching? And then we're going to apply the authorization profile. Uh, even though it's not referenced as an authorization profile, permissions basically means authorization profile. All right. Now, ICE uh, has the ability, you, know, you can um, insert or add or configure or modify specific policy elements within ICE. Uh, once you deploy ICE at its initial deployment, it's only going to have one authorization rule. All right, and that authorization rule is basically a, a closed door policy. It says I'm going to deny access and that's my default rule. Okay. As an administrator, you go in and you define all the authorization rules to implement your specific authorization policy. Each authorization rule is defined with a name, context of conditions, and then finally the referenced permissions, which is the authorization profile. So if you look at these examples here, we've got administrators matching the condition of AD group external groups equals secure dash x dot local slash user slash domain admins. So those are the attributes or values that we're matching. That is going to be assigned the uh, employee corp permission. So then you have to go back and look at what that authorization profile looks like. Employee corp says we're going to accept the access. We're going to apply this downloadable ACL. We're going to put you in this particular VLAN. Okay. Same thing for local users. That's just a name, but uh, we're identifying the, the identity group, which is employee, uh, and applying the same authorization profile to that particular rule, uh, to that particular rule that we've identified. The order of authorization rules uh, is pretty significant. By default, I supplies only the first matched rule. Just like an access list, you process it from top down. As soon as there's a match, we apply whatever that rule states. All right. Now, it can be configured to apply all matched rules, but in either case, the rule order is still very significant. All right. If ICE is configured to apply all matched rules, and we'll, uh, maybe we'll see where that configuration gets uh, um, set a little bit later on. But if ICE is configured to apply all matched rules, then the rules specify different authorization aspects. For example, the first rule specifies a VLAN and the second rule specifies a downloadable ACL. What's going to end up happening is that both authorization aspects are going to be applied to that particular authorization process. If multiple rules match, and they specify the same authorization aspects, meaning that one rule says, I'm going to apply this downloadable ACL, uh, 
and another rule says I'm going to apply this downloadable ACL and they're different ACLs, then the first match takes precedence. All right. So let's say, for example, the first match rule says uh, I'm going to put you in this VLAN and the second match rule specifies a downloadable ACL and a VLAN, then only the VLAN in the first rule gets applied, then the downloadable ACL in the second rule gets applied as well. All right. Uh, basically, we just simply ignore the VLAN that's specified in the second rule. Does that make sense? Uh, and that would be if you're doing a match all condition. Of course, if you're doing a match, match in a single instance, right, matching a single rule, it's simply processed top down, and whichever rule matches uh, the profile of the client or the endpoint or the user, we're going to apply that permission. That's those set of permissions or authorization policy to that authentication or to that author authorization. All right. So order of operation is very, very important here. Another uh, option that you have is to build out the different conditions. Conditions can be uh, defined as part of an authorization policy rule. They can be defined as kind of like a dictionary element when we define a policy element. Uh, just like we went back here and we defined um, a, a result, an authorization profile result, and then we referenced that from the author, authorization rule, we can do the same thing with these conditions. We can specify the conditions directly within the rule, or we can specify them as a policy element, add them to the library, and then they can be referenced uh, from the, um, the rule itself. That's generally how we like to proceed because oftentimes you're going to use the same conditions to match on multiple rules. So rather than having to create those conditions each time you're specifying a rule, if you make it part of the policy elements and add that to the library, then you don't have to worry about it. Okay? Uh, you can just simply reference the library instance. Simple conditions specify an attribute from ICE, uh, from the dictionary, an operand, and some sort of value. The operand could be equals, not equals, etc. Okay. Compound conditions mean that we're matching multiple com conditions combined together with a logical and or a logical or. This is an example of a compound condition. See a little diamond on the left of the condition name indicates a single condition, but by combining multiple conditions together, we're creating this compound condition scenario. Okay. All right. To set up the authorization configuration, we need to configure our rule matching logic, right? Are we going to uh, identify, you know, are we going to match the first match rule? Are we going to match all the rules? That's what I was talking about on the previous slide. Uh, we configure our policy elements, like our download, downloadable ACLs, our VLAN configurations, our profiles and whatnot. Uh, configure the authorization profile, configure the authorization conditions, and then configure the authorization rule and then tune the authorization rule as needed, uh, obviously, if we're going to modify that. If it's a brand new rule that we're configuring from start, there's really no need to tune that particular rule because we're obviously creating the rule from scratch. So we already talked about most of these elements, right? The rule, logic, mat the, the rule matching logic we spoke of, the policy elements uh, like configuring a downloadable ACL we spoke of, and then setting up the authorization profile. So let's take a real quick look at uh, the different components here. Uh, the authorization policy is going to consist of one or more rules that are processed in order. Like I said, we can do a first matched rule applies or ma uh, multiple matched rules apply. If we decide to do a first matched rule applies, um, ICE is going to apply the authorization profile that's referenced by the first match rule and it basically finishes the authorization processing for that particular given client, meaning that essentially I'm going to go ahead and process this uh, these set of rules uh, against the client uh, authorization, and as soon as there's a match condition, I'm not going to process any additional rules. The next option is to do a multiple match rules op uh, applies, where we can combine different conditions uh, and apply all of those conditions to the client. If you do have multiple matching authorization policies and multiple matches are found, we're going to combine those authorization profiles unless, like I said, there is a scenario where uh, 
uh, where one condition might override another condition in a previous rule. So uh, like two different VLAN assignments, we're going to go ahead and choose the VLAN assignment from the, from the, uh, the first rule that matches and not the second rule that matches. Uh, order of operation there is very important in that particular case. Okay. Uh, typically, the processing of logic is set before you go in and define your rules. Uh, you'll notice that the authorization policy is where we apply this, uh, you know, first match rule applies or multiple match rules apply. Uh, the rules get designed to operate according to your processing logic. So this is not, we can't apply the processing logic differently per rule, right? The, the processing logic applies to all of the rules. So it's an important consideration to take into account when you're defining the rules themselves. All right. The next element then is to specify the authorization profile, which combines multiple policy elements into a single set that can be applied to the client. ICE combines uh, uh, you know, different elements if you choose to add those elements to the, 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 the particular policy. Uh, ICE does come pre-configured with several different default authorization profiles, uh, blacklist access, Cisco IP phones, deny access, and permit access. And you can edit those individual rules or you can create your own uh, uh, based on those. So you can copy them and, and modify them as needed. Uh, generally speaking, in a lot of different cases, you're going to need more granularity. So you're going to end up creating, uh, maybe using these as templates, but then creating your own custom rules and then applying that granularity to those particular rules. Uh, so you're going to create custom authorization profiles, basically. Uh, Pre-configured authorization profile uh, can be duplicated uh, as kind of a starting point, and then you'll start to apply individual references or, or individual components to that particular role. All right. Uh, what are some of the elements that we can apply in the common task window? We can apply a downloadable ACL. Uh, we can apply a wireless uh, LAN controller ACL. Uh, we can apply a VLAN. We can specify the voice domain, uh, you know, uh, based on the Cisco IP phone and authorizing a Cisco IP phone. We can do a posture discovery uh, to enable posture discovery of the endpoint. We can do an auto smart port. To, to apply you know, different QoS parameters to a specific port. We can apply a filter ID, uh, which allows us to apply um, an ACL name that's referenced by Cisco ICE. We can do re-authentication. Uh, we can do apply a MACSEC policy. Uh, we'll talk about MACSEC in the next lesson in detail and how MACSEC works. Uh, we can apply NEAT. Um, basically, it allows us to um, apply 802.1x implementation on a switch uh, in a non-secure location like a conference room uh, and provide various authentication parameters for that particular location. We can do centralized web authentication to enable web authentication for ICE. We can do a local web authentication. So that, that basically means that we're going to tell the network access device to perform authentication locally on the network access device and then send the uh, VSA along with the downloadable ACL. And then finally, we can also apply a ASA VPN group policy to a VPN session. So there's lots and lots of different options that we have. And obviously, under the common task pane, we can choose those different options. All right. The next thing is we're going to go ahead and configure our authorization policy rule. We can see a whole lot of different uh, callouts here, but uh, if we go under policy and authorization, we can see the individual rules. So we can specify based on our dictionary, uh, different elements um, for network access, for, for domains or groups, uh, all kinds of things we can reference from the dictionary. So we see uh, match conditions uh, and we can match identity groups based on user identity groups or endpoint identity. We can uh, specify devices or certificates, endpoints, identity groups, and so on in our dictionary. Uh, we can specify network access policies, uh, use case, EAP tunnel, EAP authentication, all kinds of different things. These are all the elements that we've been speaking of, but in this case, we're referencing them all from our uh, authorization policy.
using in this case the first match rule applies and then defining the individual policy. So IT corporate assets, excuse me, IT corporate access uh, with a condition uh, and we don't see the entire element here, right? The permissions are IT corp uh, and we can see, we can at reference the permissions from uh, a drop down menu. So in a lot of cases, a lot of these elements are already defined and then we simply reference these elements as, as we're doing our configuration. All right. All right. So uh, the default rule, uh, that's the final rule in our authorization policy. Basically, what do we do with clients if they haven't matched any explicit rule that we've already identified in the process? Uh, so we might have to tune the default rule or we may just simply leave the default rule knowing that it's probably never going to get access because we have explicit rules that match every other condition that we can anticipate in our organization. But usually the default rule, initially at least when you're setting up ICE for the first time, is a rule that, that would be referenced uh, quite often actually uh, because you may not have identified all of the different scenarios or conditions that you need for authorization. So the, the uh, default action for the default rule is to deny access. So you may want to modify that uh, using a, either a fail open logic, uh, circumventing that fail close logic, uh, and so on. So the, click the plus symbol uh, near the permit access action. You can define the action that uh, is applied to that default authorization rule. Uh, there are some different pr pr um, options that you have. Right, you can do inline posture node, uh, security group standard. Uh, you can select a standard category and then choose the desired authorization profile as well, uh, based on the uh, authorizations that you want to apply. Uh, my suggestion would be definitely to tune this default rule in the initial configuration, but then once you've gone through that configuration and you've actually identified all the explicit rules that you're using in the system, then finally go back and simply uh, apply that default rule as a, a closed door policy, right? Uh, meaning that we're going to deny access if we end up matching that default rule. The ICE dashboard gives you the ability to provide a summary of all the authentications that take place on the network. We go to operations and authentication. If we activate the authorization profiles column, we can see that the authorization profile that's been applied uh, to a particular endpoint in this particular case um, Eep chaining was used, uh, the, the radius username was IT1, uh, and uh, employee PC was the hardware or device username. The identity store that was used is AD1. Uh, the identity store for, was, uh, the secondary identity store was uh, internal users. The domain was secure-x.local. Uh, the policy rule that we matched was IT corporate assets. Uh, and in this case, a PAC was issued and we I identify the endpoint MAC address and the session ID and so on, indicating that the authentication was applied using the authorization profile IT underscore corp. All right, and we can then drill down into IT underscore corp to see uh, what specifically, what elements of the authorization profile were applied to this particular session. All right. We can recognize in this particular case, EAP chaining because of the uh, double arrow, right? You see where it says IT1, um, and then we have the, the double arrow that indicates EAP chaining uh, between the user and the machine identity, meaning that we actually authorized both elements, right? The user and the machine in this particular case, IT1, double arrow, host employee slash dash PC. All right, that, that means that we're using EAP chaining with uh, user and machine both succeeded in this particular case. All right, another option that we have is to verify uh, machine authorization on ICE as well. Uh, we can see that the authorization profile that was applied in this particular case was machine underscore corp. The user authentication failed but the machine succeeded in this case. Now that's not necessarily a bad thing. It could simply mean that the user logged off and we're still maintaining authentication based on the machine. Uh, we're still using EAP chaining in this case and we're using AD1 as our uh, 
uh, authentication identity store number one and internal users is identity store number two. Uh, and uh, in this case, we were still able to identify the endpoint, so we were able to authenticate the endpoint 10.10.10.10 uh, .10 .10 .10 .10, uh, using eatfast MS chat v2. So eatfast is the outer tunnel method. MS chat v2 is the inner tunnel method in this particular case. That's why you see two different uh, uh, authentication protocols supported in this particular scenario because of that tunneling. All right. We have the ability to identify authentication on the authenticator as well on the switch. Show authentication session interface command. That's going to give us the username of the authenticated user, the authorization results. Uh, the status of the session reports authorization success in this case. A downloadable ACL was applied to the endpoint. Uh, the network access device is not technically aware of the authorization profile name that's been used in ICE that, was, uh, that allowed us to apply the ACL to the endpoint, but it doesn't really need that, right? It just simply needs to know what the name of the downloadable ACL is, and, and then we... Uh, based on that name, we then apply that ACL. Remember that downloadable ACL was already available to this network access device previously. All right. All right. If I want to see the actual downloadable ACL on the switch, I can use the command uh, show IP access list or show IP access list interface and we can actually see the downloadable ACL. Uh, we can see it's referenced. I mean, it, it looks basically like a regular extended access list, right? Denying a protocol based on source and destination address. Uh, actually, three, three instances of denying a protocol. ICMP for uh, 2.10.2.20, to 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 uh, ICMP to 10.10.3.20, and then TCP to 10.10.3.20 if it's equal to HTTP traffic, right? So it looks like a regular extended ACL, all right? But it is applied uh, as a downloadable ACL, and we can see that referenced right here, and that's what, uh, uh, that's what will allow us to identify that it's a downloadable ACL. We can also see here uh, per user. It's being applied per user. So, um, uh, and then we can actually see that it's applied to interface uh, gig01. Uh, show, uh, show IP interface would, would show us essentially the same thing as well. Okay. So that concludes this lesson. In uh, module number three, we talked about how ICE performs authorization to assign privileges to client sessions. Authorization is performed after authentication, obviously, uh, in, in, the, in the, you know, the scheme of things and the process of things. Uh, when the client identity is established and after the client's been authenticated, then we're going to apply our authorization. Uh, downloadable ACLs are very common authorization policy elements as well as applying a VLAN. Um, but as we saw, there were probably about 15 or 16 different policy elements that we could apply uh, based on what our overall objective is. We also talked about authorization profiles as a set of privileges and actions that get applied to a particular session and then how we can do rule match conditions and apply those authorization profiles to the client itself. All right, so that concludes that lesson. In lesson number three, uh, we are going to get into, in module number three, lesson number three, Cisco TrustSec and MacSec. Uh, it's a very, very uh, large section that we're gonna go through, but it's quite uh, interesting. It's uh, probably something that you two probably aren't as familiar with working with, um, using security group tags and, and, and using SGT aware devices and how we can apply CTS and SGA uh, deployment procedures to our environment. So that's what we're going to focus on in the next lesson. So we'll see you guys in lesson number three a little bit later.